Let's take out our Bibles this morning and uh, turn once again uh, to the book of Romans. We've been going through a series in uh, Romans chapter 12, and uh, so I appreciate the, uh, the positive feedback I've received. Um, and uh, last Sunday, I know I, I, I was... Uh, I, didn't, I was shocked at how long I preached. I said, oh, I, didn't, I haven't preached that long in a long time. So, uh, but then I had a, 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 a get-together with one of the people and the uh, people that comes to the church, and they said, oh, boy, I really uh, appreciate the message on Sunday. And they said, uh, they said, my only criticism, and I thought, oh, here we go. It was too long. No, they said, it wasn't long enough. And I thought, well, can I, can I quote you on that? Can I put that in the bulletin, please? Uh, but uh, so we're going to be finishing up Romans chapter 12 this morning. And uh, before we get to God's word, let's bow our heads and we'll pray. And we'll ask the Lord to uh, speak to our hearts today. Father in heaven, we come before you and we, we worship you today. We come before you and we open up your holy word before us. We are so thankful that in your grace you looked down upon us, that you saw fit to give us this revelation of who you are, to pour out before us the saving work, the life and the death of Jesus Christ on the cross before us with crystal clarity so that we could look, and be, look to him and be saved. We thank you that when we were without strength, Christ died for us. And Lord, as we get to the word this morning, I pray that more and more every day, our lives would be a continuing reflection of the the work of Jesus Christ for us and saving us and his continuing work in us to make us more like him every day. Oh, Lord, uh, give us attention to the word today. We all come here with myriads of things that have dominated our minds throughout the week. No doubt some have come here today with troubled hearts, discouraged over things that they're going through even today. I pray that there would be a single-hearted attention to God's word and a, an expectancy that you are going to speak to us in a powerful way. And would you do just that, Lord? Don't allow us to leave this place the same way in which we came. I pray for those who are unsaved, that you would work in their hearts and draw them to Jesus today. I pray for every believer that there would be a powerful awakening in our hearts a desire that the Holy Spirit would work in us to make us more like Christ today. I pray for our junior church ministry today that you would bless, uh, bless your word as it goes forward to the ears and the hearts of our little ones. And I pray for gospel proclaiming churches all around this community and all around the world. That today would be a day of, a, of the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ to the sweeping in of countless souls into the kingdom of heaven today. We commit this time to you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So as we've been in Romans chapter 12, we see a description of the Christian life, a Christian life that is submitted to God. This life of submission to God, it says in verse 1, is our reasonable service. That which, when we understand the God, well, first of all, when we have, when that, when the spiritual work of God in our hearts has taken hold so that we have come to Jesus as Savior, it is the reasonable, it is the intelligent response to what God has done for us. When we understand the truths of the gospel, what will flow from it is a life of submission to God. Becoming a Christian, as we've said over and over again, becoming a Christian is not merely an intellectual exercise. And that is something that is so vastly misunderstood by many. 
So many says, oh yeah, I believe this, I believe that, I've checked off all of these boxes, thinking that mere intellectual assent to certain facts makes somebody a Christian. That is not what it means to be a Christian. The, uh, the Christianity is, built, is beyond the intellect. It goes to a matter of the heart. But growing in the Christian life is going to spring from a mind and a heart that is resting on the realities of the gospel and growing and deepening grasp on the power and the sweetness of God's saving grace in Christ. And this is for the believer. If you know Christ as your Savior, this is your new identity. This is more than what you know. This is who you are. The work of the Holy Spirit of renewing our minds is going to result, as we saw in, uh, in verse 2, is going to result in us being daily transformed instead of uh, slavish conformity to the world around us. As it says, we are being transformed by the renewing of our minds. This world, this culture, what makes it tick, we can look around us and we can see things are darker by the day. Things in this world, things in our culture are ugly. It is miserable. Rampant misery, rampant despair, and sheer hopelessness everywhere we look. I mean, you look around at the world today, people are on the edge, aren't they? People all everywhere, everybody is on the edge. And it's leading us into deepening darkness and despair. And when God begins His work of sanctification, that work by the Holy Spirit of making us more like Jesus every day, when He begins that work, continues that work in the life of a Christian, He starts with what is the biggest battlefield, the root of so many of our problems. And we saw this last week in verse 3, and this is kind of the heading for the rest of the chapter. It says that we must not think of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. Don't think of yourselves more highly than we ought to think. Augustine said it was pride that changed angels into devils. It is humility that makes men as angels. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to think. So often, and I won't ask for a show of hands because I wouldn't get any, uh, if I, maybe if I said, how many of you, your spouse was guilty of this, and maybe a lot of hands would go up. Probably, you know, both hands, my husband and wife would both raise their hands. But how many of us are, guilt, are guilty of taking ourselves way too seriously at times? How many of us are guilty of thinking of ourselves way too much? Easily offended? How many times are we guilty of when somebody has uh, offended us, has sinned against us, we make forgiveness and reconciliation way too hard? I know I've often looked at myself and said, hold on a second, guy. If God made reconciliation and forgiveness as hard as you are making it with this other person, we'd all be hopeless. We need to mirror the heart of God, being willing to let go of things, being willing to allow people who have offended us and, and sinned against us uh, to, to be forgiven and, to, and to, uh, to, to be able to have reconciliation in those relationships. Let me just read you a, what I call, prescription for unhappiness. All right, so if you want to be miserable, if you want to be unhappy, here's the way to do it. Number one, make little things bother you. Don't just let them bother you, make them bother you. Number two, lose perspective of things. Keep it lost. Don't put first things first. Three, get yourself a good worry. One about which you can do nothing but simply worry. Get yourself a good worry. Number four, be a perfectionist. Condemn yourself and others for not, uh, for not achieving your perfection. Next, be right. Always right. 
perfectly right all the time. Be the only one who is right and be rigid about your rightness. Don't trust or believe people or accept them at anything but their worst and weakest. Be suspicious. Impute in, uh, ulterior motives to everybody around you. Seven, always compare yourself unfavorably to others, which is the guarantee of instant misery. Number eight, take personally and with a chip on your shoulder everything that happens to you that you don't like. Nine, give yourself wholeheartedly and enthusiastically to, don't give yourself wholeheartedly or enthusiastically to anyone or anything. And last, make happiness the aim of your life instead of bracing for life's barbs through a bitter and sweet philosophy. So use that prescription every day uh, and you will be guaranteed unhappiness. You will be guaranteed to be miserable. All of those things, what do they flow from? They flow from exactly what Romans 12, 3 is talking about. Thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think. All right? So last week we saw how thinking of ourselves rightly, not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think is going to be lived out. We saw last week first how it's applied in the body of believers. And that was in verses 3 through 13. This morning I want to continue on beginning in verse 14 through, uh, through the end of the chapter with the application of how we deal with the rest of the people around us. How we deal with people in this world. Unbelievers. Sometimes even unbelievers that might oppose us simply because we're Christians. And some of you work with somebody or you have somebody in your family who is antagonistic toward you simply because you are a Christian. And that is a hard thing to deal with. This passage talks specifically about that. We've seen how this gospel transformed life demonstrates itself in the church. How does it demonstrate itself outside of these walls? So Romans chapter 12, let's begin our reading in verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, if you had, uh, if you were going to be away, you were going to be uh, on vacation for a few days, and you needed to have somebody or maybe a few different people come by your house while you're away and water your plants, feed your fish or whatever. You're going to leave, you might want to leave a key for that person. You don't want to leave your, your house unlocked for that whole time. Now, where are you going to leave your key? Generally, you're going to either leave your key at the front door or you're going to leave it at the back door. Now, here in this text... Uh, we saw at the beginning of the section a key at the front door. Don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think. And that governs the rest of the chapter. But you know, interestingly, we also see a key at the back door. At the very end of the chapter, another summary statement of this section. Do not be overcome by evil 
but overcome evil with good. And so that is kind of a restatement. It's a recapitulation of everything that the Apostle Paul has said in this section. All right, don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's impossible to do good for somebody and have angry, hateful, resentful thoughts toward that person at the same time. It's impossible. When you, when you, when you set out to, to do good for somebody, it's, it, and I won't ask for how many have had this experience recently. You know, you, it's not happened to me, but I've heard it's happened with some of you. You get into a tiff with your spouse. I've never had that. But, uh, you know, you get into a tiff with your spouse and your husbands, you've said something you ought not say. And so you say, ah, you know, I need to go and I need to buy her some flowers. I need to get her some candy. I need to do something that would, uh, that would really uh, be a, a gesture of my contrition. You know what you find yourself, even if when you set foot into that florist shop, if you, when you set foot in that place, if you were still churning with maybe some uh, negative thoughts toward your spouse, you quickly find yourself with those things gone because what are you thinking about? I wonder what kind of flowers she would like. I wonder what kind of candy she would like. What did I get her last time? I don't want to get the same thing again. So you can't be overcome with evil and have a good disposition to seek to be a blessing to somebody at the same time. And so the challenge for us is we deal with people who sometimes are dead set against us simply because of the fact, and not generally the case, but some of you have to deal with this, somebody that is dead set against you simply because of your faith in Jesus Christ, it is impossible for us to be resentful toward that person and seek to do good for them at the same time. How do we do this? Well, first of all, we pray for people. We seek to meet their needs. We find out what those needs are. Sometimes it's just by genuinely kind words. And that's the, that's the overarching command. And these verses, the verses in this section give us commands for how we are going to do this. How am I going to overcome evil with good? Well, the very first thing that it says, bless the ones who persecute you. Bless the ones who persecute you. No, no matter how hard I worked to try to clump these things together and say, well, you know, the first ones, are they talking about this general heading and the second ones are talking about this. I couldn't figure out, uh, I couldn't figure out that structure. So I'm just going to rapid fire, give you these things. What are the ways that we are going to overcome evil outside, the, uh, outside of the walls of the church in my dealing with difficult people? How am I going to do it? First of all, Bless the ones who persecute you. Keep your finger there in Romans and turn back to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said, verse 44, He says, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. And do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and on the unjust. Jesus is here talking about this love, which is a love of choice. It is a choosing, it is an act of my will, whereby I am saying I am going to demonstrate and feel love toward this person. It's not a reactionary type of love. It is a love of choice. Sometimes there are going to be people in your life that are going, to, that your reaction your knee-jerk reaction to them will not be love. You're going to have to make that choice to do good to that person and go out of your way to seek to be good to that person. 
But when we do that, we are reflecting the love of the cross. That's why Jesus said that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Does he mean that by this you are going, that it's going to achieve your salvation? No. The sonship is talking about a similarity. This is our opportunity to mirror his love for us. We who were enemies are brought near to God by the love of Christ. He gives us this opportunity to mirror what he has done for us. In the preceding verses in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus has taught us here that when someone slaps you in the face, turn the other cheek to give them the opportunity to do it again instead of retaliating. You know, I would imagine that if I were to take a poll, I would rather, I would rather be punched in the face than slapped in the face. Because a slap in the face is just such a, there's something about that that is so demeaning, right? And some of you are looking at me like, you have lost your mind. But some of you are saying, yeah, I, I'm with him on this. And so if you're with me, you, you understand what I'm saying. If, I, if you think I've lost my mind, uh, you must have been Sunday school because I was having a hard time in Sunday school. But, uh, you know, there is something so demeaning. There is something so, uh, th there's a few things that would communicate dishonoring somebody, to me anyways, in my, in my thinking, than a slap in the face. And so Jesus is saying we have to be willing to surrender that honor. All right? Um, Forgo my honor, forgo my dignity, so that I can be more like my heavenly Father. Here, in, it says to bless those who curse you. When they speak evil, when they speak harshly, when they speak harmful words against you, how are you supposed to respond? Well, our general response is when somebody speaks uh, harshly toward me, or at least what I interpret as harshly, what do I want to do? I give it right back to them. You use a sharp tongue against me, my sharp tongue will be unsheathed, and I will show my skill at dicing you a little bit. That is our temptation. Jesus says, that's not like your heavenly father. When someone curses you, you respond opposite. Don't respond in kind. Respond opposite. You speak blessing toward them. Bless those who curse you. That's easy to say in a sermon. That's hard to put into practice. Hard. It takes much prayer. In Romans 12, it says to bless those who who persecute you, bless and do not curse. So the, in both passages, the blessing is the opposite of what it's put against. In the words of Jesus, blessing is the opposite of cursing. Here, blessing is the opposite of persecuting. So when someone acts toward me in a hostile way, in an injurious way, I need to find a way to respond in a way that is gracious, respond in a way that is building up, that is strengthening to them toward these because of who they are. Because this person is difficult toward me, because of who this person is, I need to go out of my way to find a way to be good to them. That's a difficult thing. And it's something you're not going to just come up with in the heat of the moment. So think about the people in your life that are difficult for you to deal with. You know what you should have? You should write it down somewhere because in the heat of the moment, you will not remember it. You should write down somewhere, here is how I am going to determine I'm going to be good to that person. Have you done anything like that before? Have you gone out of your way to follow what this says to bless those who persecute you? The second thing it says we should be doing, it says to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And again, remember, this is a reflection of what God has done for us. This is a reflection of the gospel back out toward people around us. This is an opportunity for us to live out 
the message that we're speaking out. We are sharing the gospel with them with our words. We are living out the gospel by our actions. I do it, first of all, by blessing those who persecute me. I do it, secondly, by rejoicing with those who rejoice and weeping with those who weep. Now, in verse 2, we were told, as we saw this last week, that our minds are not to be conformed to this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of our minds. But here we see that this, in, this, uh, this non-conformity to the world does not look like isolationism. How often are we tempted toward this? We say the world is wicked. I don't like what I see out there. I want to cloister myself. I want to separate myself. I want to get away from people that, are, that act negatively toward me. Here it says that we need to be close enough that we can feel with them. Not isolating ourselves, not cloistering, cloistering ourselves, but so close that when they are rejoicing, we can rejoice with them. When they are weeping, we can weep with them. Even toward unbelievers, get to know them. Enter into people's lives who are around you and let them enter your life. As a Christian, my question for you this morning is this. Do you have relationships that today you are currently fostering these relationships for the purpose of, draw, of uh, sharing the gospel with these people? Now, don't give in to the temptation of getting to know these people for weeks, months, even years, saying, you know, when the time is right, I'll share the gospel with them. That's a contradiction. Why? Because the gospel is that which is foundational to who we are. And so from the very beginning, these people should know you're a Christian. They should know that Christ has saved you and you pray that God would give you continued opportunities to expose them to the gospel of Jesus Christ as you get to know them better. You should be cultivating those relationships for the purpose of having an opportunity to share the gospel with them. It says uh, this, the, what this means is that in my life, I need to be real with people. Don't be so proud that you don't allow people to see your joys. Don't, sit, don't be so proud that you don't allow people in to see your sorrows. And that's a real struggle for many. And of course, we're going to have this same type of relationship with believers. And I personally think that when verse 16 says, be of the same mind toward one another, that this is what he's referring to. I think Paul is saying here, of course you're going to, among believers, rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. That goes without saying, but let that extend outside the walls of the church, have relationship with people that you're getting to know them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. How else is my life going to be a reflection of God's grace toward unbelievers? The next thing, don't set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Don't set your mind on these high things. And this is a parallel to verse 3 where it says, uh, where it says don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think. This is a battle in our relationship with other believers. It's a real battle in our relationship with unbelievers. Just communicating ourselves in a way that seems proud, in a way that seems arrogant. Think for your, think with me for a minute. What is what are some of the biggest complaints, criticisms? that people lay against professing believers. They say, oh, you bunch of Christians, you think you're better than everyone else. Isn't that what they say? You think you're so high, you think you're so mighty, you think you've got everything together. And we're quick to say, no, 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 that's not true. And I hope that's not true about you. But understand, men and women, where there's smoke, 
there's fire. Whether intentionally or not intentionally, unless we are working on it, unless we are setting out to do it, if we're not careful, we are going to communicate ourselves in a way that is interpreted as proud. And a, and a proud, a conceited Christian, that's a contradiction of terms. Of all people, if you're a believer today, you ought to be the one that says yes. I don't have life together. I need God's grace every day. I am a failing person. I am a person who is struggling with the world and the flesh and the devil. I need God's grace upon me every day. And I don't have all the answers, but I do have a resource where I can get the answers. And I need to pray for God's help every day to get more and more into that book. We need to go out of our way to not set our minds on high things. And what this is talking about is that arrogant, conceited spirit about us, but instead associate, let our lives be associated with humility. Don't be wise in your own opinion. What does that mean? Don't be a know-it-all. Don't be a know-it-all. There are some people that you talk to and no matter what subject you're talking about, they know everything about everything. At least they're convinced they do. Let that not be the case for the believer. Let that not be the case. Paul said, I've determined to know one thing among you, and that is Christ crucified. There is one hill upon which I'm willing to die. There is one hill upon which I'm willing to say, hey, this is the truth. I'm not going to, uh, I'm not going to forfeit this reality of who Jesus is, what he has done for me. Now about other things, politics, you talk about sickness, you talk about things in our society, there's a lot of answers I don't have. And I don't claim to be an expert on these things. There's one thing that I'm willing to die for, and that's the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be wise in your own opinion. And if there is one statement that should have been more characteristic of believers in the last few years, that's it. Stop being wise in your own opinions. Next, verse 17. Don't repay evil for evil. Repay no one evil for evil. Don't let harmful things that have been done to you uh, drive you toward and breed in your heart an inclination to do harmful things toward others. Very often in some of, some, some of you in this room, you've been wronged. Some of you in this room, you have been, even recently maybe, you have been deeply and profoundly injured by someone you thought you could trust. Very often when this happens, we allow ourselves to sink into bitterness. We allow ourselves to sink into the depths of cynicism and we close ourselves off from other people. We respond in a fleshly proud way by uh, closing ourselves and refusing to commit myself to other people, Re closing myself off from giving myself and loving other people. The book of Hebrews tells us, consider Jesus. Dear Christian that is struggling, dear Christian, you who are battling people doing wrong against you, consider Jesus who endured the contradiction of sinners against himself. 1 Peter 2 says that when he was insulted, when he was injured, when he was berated by, by in, in word, when he was assaulted physically, how did Jesus respond? He responded by doing good. Don't repay evil for evil. Number five. It says, have, uh, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. So what this is referring to is having a reputation as a Christian 
in this world, in the workplace, among your relatives, in your neighborhood, what should be your reputation since you're a child of God? Since you are reflecting the gospel to people around you, you ought to have a reputation of behaving honestly. You ought to have a reputation of acting appropriately toward others. You know, what is the, uh, how terrible it is when a Christian in the workplace has the reputation of being the one who tries to get away with things. What a terrible thing it is when, the rep, when a Christian has the reputation and so often is the first one to brag about this before others, of always being the one to try to find the loopholes to not have to pay everything they have to pay or to get out of doing things that they don't want to do. What a terrible thing it is when a person who claims to be a Christian has the reputation of being the expert at knowing how to work the system. It ought not be this way. It says we ought to have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Behave honestly. Behave appropriately. Don't act out. Don't be out of line. People should not spend time with me in a social gathering and see the way that I behave or the way that I speak and come away saying, that's not right. The way that he spoke to that person, that wasn't right. That ought not be our reputation. We ought to have the reputation of people who know how to conduct ourselves, people who know how to behave ourselves appropriately. Isn't that what we as Christian parents are trying to teach our children? We're trying to teach our children how to behave themselves appropriately in every environment. There is a certain way you behave yourself at home, a certain way you behave yourself at church, certain way you behave yourself in the store, certain way you behave yourself at grandma's house. Okay? And as Christians, we ought to be, and as parents, take the opportunity to teach your children this is more than just rules and regulations. This is our opportunity to live out Christianity toward people around us. And moms and dads, we ought to be doing that same thing. Behave ourselves appropriately. Next, number six, live peaceably with all men. Live peaceably with all men. We are ambassadors of God's peace. Jesus Christ in Isaiah chapter six, one of the titles that was prophetically given to him, the Prince of Peace. Jesus Christ, his, uh, the gospel, what Jesus did in his life and his death is our only way to have peace with God. And we are ambassadors of that peace. We are to be living out a reality that is bigger than our existence. Now, Paul also recognizes that peace is a two-way street. There are people that no matter how much we work to try to cultivate a relationship of peace and peacefulness with that person, they are going to respond with antagonism. Peace is, he says, as much as it is possible. As much as it is possible. That means when somebody is dead set to not be at peace with me, I can't change their hearts. Only God can change their hearts. But I can change my heart by God's help by God's grace, by the Holy Spirit, by this renewing of my mind that I'm praying for, and I can change, therefore, my demeanor, my actions, my words toward that person. As much as it is possible, live peaceably with all men. I can't, uh, so I've got to seek by my actions and by my words to not be stirring the pot of that disharmony toward that person. And I would imagine the overwhelming majority of you in this room today have somebody in mind that you say they just refuse to be at peace. That's a challenge. But this is a tall order as a reflection of what God has done for us. Remember, the Bible says that before you were saved, you were an enemy of God. Your heart beat in defiance against God. How did God respond toward you? The Bible says he's long-suffering to you. 
Long-suffering. Are you being long-suffering, giving that person every opportunity to embrace the peace that you're putting out there day after day after day after day? Don't give up. Thank God. God didn't give up on you, did he? Praise God for that. Why are you giving up on somebody else? Live peaceably with all men. Lastly, it says do not avenge yourselves. Do not avenge yourselves. Put your wrath in its proper place. Commit your situation to God. When you take it upon yourself, and so when it talks about vengeance, there is an assumption that is given here. Somebody has injured you. Someone has acted in a harmful way toward you. And what we want to do, and believe me, I'm talking about myself. I'm not saying what you want to do, and I don't deal with this. I deal with the same thing. When someone, when someone gives me a blistering insult, what do I want to do? I want to come right back. I want to respond in the exact same way, but maybe turn those screws a little bit more. What does the Bible say? Can't do that. You can't do that. Do not avenge yourselves. Put your wrath in its proper place. Venge, God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So if you're a Christian, you need to realize today, God's going to settle all those accounts. You don't need to live your life saying, you know what, that person needs to pay for what they did. That's God's business. It's not your business. God says vengeance belongs to him. We don't always interpret things rightly. Sometimes someone has acted toward you in a way that hurt you. But sometimes the reason that it hurt you the way that it did was because of your mindset at that very moment. You were assuming even beforehand that that person was going to say something or act toward you in a negative way. And so you assumed that what they said was hurtful. So many times, and really statistically speaking, the overwhelming majority of the times, husbands and wives... And we all know it's true. How often do we get in our corners, put on our boxing gloves and duke it out? Not literally. I hope not. How many big fights have you had over stuff, stupid stuff, that was just a misunderstanding from the beginning? And pretty soon you're not even arguing over the original thing. You're arguing over the other things that came out of the other things that came out of the other things of this thing. And you can't even remember what you were angry to begin with. We misunderstand things. We misinterpret things. We lash back at people. We make people feel pain that they sent toward us and they didn't even intend to make us hurt. God sees all of these things perfectly. God says, I will repay. You don't need to worry about that. I will repay, says the Lord. And as, as, uh, as, as Christians, we need to communicate not only through our words, but through our lives. I trust God. That's easy for us to say when everybody is saying nice things to us. It's hard to say when someone has acted in a way that profoundly hurts us. That's when the rubber meets the road. Do you trust God truly? Or do you just say that you trust God? Ultimately, this kind of living, even toward people who are antagonistic toward us, is our opportunity to live out the gospel. God looked down on you and me when we were wicked enemies. God demonstrated his love toward us, Romans chapter 5, in Christ dying for us. As this gospel permeates our minds, we are going to, this renewed mind is going to seek to live out this gospel. This is our opportunity. This is the realm in which our gospel should shine the brightest. And ultimately, my call to behave this way isn't limited to my relationship with that person. 
it's governed by a bigger relationship of my relationship to God. Living this way toward those who are evil toward us is going to work to their shame. And there's been a lot of discussion on uh, verse, uh, uh, on verse 20 where it says, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. What does that mean? Does that mean that my doing good is going to incinerate this person? Well, if I'm doing good because I want to incinerate this person, then maybe I don't really have the right heart, okay? So that's not quite the direction that I think the Lord is communicating to us here. Others have said coals of fire, a way that people warm themselves. You're heaping good things toward this person. That could be true, but it doesn't seem like that's what this is talking about. One commentator that I was reading had an idea that, uh, that this was a, he says this was an Egyptian, referring to an Egyptian custom that when someone wanted to demonstrate public shame over some wrongdoing, that they would take a pan and put it on their head and put coals of fire in the pan. I'm not sure the thickness of the pan and how much it actually burned the flesh on their head. That I don't know. But that it was symbolic of the shame burning into their minds. And so, so his proposition was saying, for in so doing, you will heap coals of fire in his head. Your behaving in a good way is going to, when someone they do wrong to you, you respond with good, they are dead set to do wrong against you, that's going to that's gonna bring shame upon them before other people. That's as good as idea, of, of ideas as I've got on what that means. You know, we can't live our lives. Again, back to the, to the overarching statements. Don't think of yourselves more highly than you ought to think. Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You can't live your life wrapped up in self. You can't live your life that way. You can't live your life for the goals of self-protection, self-promotion, self-proclamation. And when we've been hurt, what do we want to do? When I've been hurt, I want to protect myself. But the Lord says, no, you can't live your life like that. You will be miserable. You will be out of step with God. You will be out of touch with others. You will have no gospel. And it is a terrible reflection of the way God has, has demonstrated his love toward you. It's a small existence. Charles Swindoll said, the world's smallest package is a man wrapped up in himself. Amy Carmichael great missionary to India. She founded uh, orphanages and served in those orphanages for some 55 years. And by the way, she was in India for 55 years, never came home on a furlough or on a visit. 55 years. A few years ago when I went to India, I was able to see the place where her orphanages were. But Amy Carmichael who had, on the basis of her ministry, has status to say it. She says, those who think too much about themselves don't think enough. It's a good way to put it. Those who think too much about themselves don't think enough. This life of submission to God, this yielded life that the Christian must have as a response to the gospel, this is the reasonable, it is the rational, the intelligent way to respond to what has been done for us by the grace of the cross of Jesus Christ. How are we doing? How are we doing in our relationships among one another? But for today, let's think about how am I doing when I leave this place to go back to complicated, difficult relationships that I've got with other people. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you would take this very challenging portion of Scripture and by your Holy Spirit apply it to our hearts. There is nobody in this room that has got this together. We all struggle with it, Father. But I pray that today we would take an honest look 
at our hearts, at our lives. We pray that your Holy Spirit would pull back all the pretense and give us a glimpse to how we're struggling with people around us. I pray that truly we would not be overcome with evil, but that we would overcome evil with good. Teach us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.